Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Blueprint for Clean Energy webinar series. Um, really excited to have everybody coming in today. I know we're on winter break for, for a lot of the school, but this is a great time to kind of spend some time investing in some of the practitioners in the clean energy space. And we have a really exciting talk for everybody today. Uh, I'm very excited. We are lucky to have Steph Spears with us today, CEO and co-founder of Solstice. Um, she's going, I'm going to, believe me, you're not going to hear a lot from me. You're going to go right, we're going to go right to Steph. But Steph is a, a social entrepreneur with a, a mission to really bring clean, renewable energy to everyone. And to, to make it uh, to make it available for the masses, you know, almost 80% of the United States right now can't get access to solar and to clean energy for numerous reasons. So uh, it's been Steph's mission to really try to fix that number and sway it in the opposite direction. Uh, Steph has a BA from Yale, an MPA from Princeton, and an MBA from MIT, which is not only impressive but also a ton of acronyms. So. That's, it's really amazing, and, and we're really uh, looking forward to hearing her talk. Um, really want you guys to, to use this, too, as an opportunity to ask questions. So, you know, you can put them in the Q&A. You can put them in the chat. We're going to be looking at them throughout the conversation today as well. So please, um, all the attendees, you know, make sure you're asking, uh, make sure you're asking questions. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to kick it over to Steph Spears. Thank you, Steph. Thank you. Hey, everyone. My name is Steph Spears. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Solstice. Really happy to be with you virtually uh, in my alma mater. And I am going to talk a little bit about Solstice, a little bit about energy equity and how to make the energy system more just and equitable. Uh, and then I was asked to, to start out talking about how I even got into this work. So I never wanted to be an entrepreneur. I did not want to touch it with a 10 foot pole, mostly because my father was a failure. And I was a child of two immigrants. Um, and when my dad's business went out of business, he, he, we lost everything. Um, and before we knew it, we were surviving because we were living off of food stamps. And then, um, as ha happens with a lot of families, if you don't have a lot of money, you start fighting more. And eventually, my mom decided to leave my father, who um, in times of stress wasn't the, the best dad. And she raised three kids alone on a salary And she's raising three kids, all probably below the age of 10 at this point. And so my mom um, really, because she, she takes on extra jobs, she works in a call center, uh, she gets yelled at every day. to go to these great, amazing academic institutions. And I'm in these rare where I know that my mom could never enter these rooms because of things that are outside her control, like what, she, what where she's a citizen of or, or where she was born, what her accent is. And so my whole city bill, like our rent bill, um, we were evicted from a few apartments because we couldn't make rent. And so if you have one of your feet all your life in the most elite institutions in the world and your other foot is in a world in which people are locked out of access of, from things through no fault of their own, then it's hard to do anything but realize that the point of privilege is to use privilege to open up opportunities for people who don't have a voice or don't have a say or don't have power. I cannot rationalize having privilege any other way. And so throughout my career, um, I've done a few different things from government service to working on political campaigns, but everything in my work has always been about how do we create opportunities for people through no fault of their own um, that are locked out of opportunities? How do we build organizations and communities 
that allow struggling families to enjoy the benefits of beautiful places like Yale and other um, uh, the other best parts of, of, of uh, what life offers. So. Our obsession is how do we make solar so easy and so affordable that everyone can do it? And please tell me if you can't see this, the slides. But essentially, Solstice is working to put solar in the hands of people who are excluded. Well, why are people excluded? So the fact that we can have have a conversation about democratizing access to solar is because of this amazing cost curve. That orange line is the dropping cost of solar in the last you know, 20 years. Solar has precipitously dropped in cost and it's now as cheap as fossil fuels uh, in, in many countries in the world, in many localities in the world. And the prediction is we'll get there everywhere in the next. Solar is so cheap enough that it can help people. Very few people can get access to it. Actually, four out of five Americans are home. And maybe it's because they're a renter or a condo owner. Maybe it's because they have a tree covering their roof or their roof is facing the wrong way or it's made out of the wrong materials like slate or it's flat or it's a historic roof like in Boston where we are based. Or maybe they're not a high income homeowner and so they don't have the money to pay for the 10 to 40 thousand dollars it'll cost to put solar on their roof or they don't have the fico credit score needed to get access to solar financing you actually need a pretty high fico credit score which we'll get back to later so that means that the vast majority of us are actually locked out of the solar market at a time where solar can give people savings but also at a time where the only way we're gonna fix climate change is if we democratize access to solar savings. If we democratize access to clean energy, we will unlock our, um, we will cut off our addiction to fossil fuels, but until we make solar more accessible, this is never gonna happen. So there's a solution out there and it's called community solar. I expect a lot of folks already know and have heard, heard of community solar. It can mean a lot of things. So I'll take 30 seconds to explain what we mean by it. Rather than put solar on your own rooftop, you're buying a portion of a neighborhood shared solar farm. The electricity is flowing back to the grid and you as a participant would see a credit that shows up on your monthly utility bill for the solar that's produced virtually. The, for the vast majority of these projects across the country, they're actually subscription model meaning you're not gonna pay anything up front, you're not gonna put, put anything on your home, you're just paying for the power that's produced by your portion of the solar farm, and you're generally getting it at a guaranteed discount compared to what you would have paid your utility. So guaranteed discount, don't put anything on your home, don't pay anything up front, pretty good value proposition, um, and the most affordable and accessible type of solar for people, especially because so few people are willing to pay a premium for clean energy in this country. So a few people can pay a premium because everyone, um, there's an economic crisis right now. And so if we get clean energy to more people, we're gonna have to figure out how to make it affordable. Solstice's um, bread and butter is we manage the whole customer experience for these community solar projects. We don't build them ourselves. Um, occasionally we co-develop projects to that are low income focused but in general we take care of the customer experience rather than the development side of things so if we enroll customers we connect them to community solar farms in their local community we handle the billing and the crediting the integration with utility accounts for the life of the 20-year project and we own that whole customer experience largely so we can make it more inclusive. I talked earlier about how your FICO score may determine whether you get solar financing in this country. And the thing is, very few people um, actually know this unless they're going out and signing people up for solar, but FICO credit scores are used by financiers and developers to determine who can benefit from residential solar, whether it's rooftop or community solar. Generally, that FICO cutoff is 680 and above. As it turns out, more than half the country doesn't have that credit score, so they can never access solar financing. And the only way they can get solar is if they can pay upfront for solar, which not that many people can do. And so if we continue to qualify people using FICO, we're eliminating half the country from getting solar. 
Yet, when you look at how FICO credit scores are calculated, FICO doesn't measure whether you pay your utility bills on time. It doesn't measure whether you pay your cell phone bills on time. It doesn't measure whether you pay your, your, um, your rental bills on time. So you can have a half a million dollar mortgage and have a higher FICO credit score than someone who is just paying their rent on time every month. So FICO is actually pretty discriminatory based on the asset classes it analyzes. Um, it's a discriminatory against renters, which inevitably, and low income households, and it's discriminatory against inevitably black and brown folks in America. So why are we qualifying people for solar using the FICO credit score if it doesn't even actually measure that many relevant payments? What we did um, uh, at Solstice is we actually created our own score called the energy score. And it's based on your utility repayment history and of other alternative data that's not taken into account by FICO. And we found that our energy score is more accurate at predicting who pays their utility bills than FICO credit scores. And it's more inclusive of low to moderate income Americans. So I'll say that again. Our energy score is more accurate at predicting who will pay their utility bills, and it's more inclusive of low to moderate income Americans that would have been locked out of the solar industry had we used the FICO credit score. And this is, this is the point of innovation. We, uh, to, for centuries, since FICO was invented in the 1950s, we have used FICO as a quote unquote objective measure of our credit worthiness. And the fact of the matter is we live in a modern era now. We can do better than FICO. We have more data sources. We're, we just haven't created the algorithms or the innovations that allow us to move beyond this archaic qualification standard of FICO. And so this is a, a big part of what we do is try to unlock access for people who have never had access to, to clean energy before. And uh, you know, this is one of our customers, Joan. She actually is also like my mom was a single mom. She's in the state of New York. And she said, I initially didn't even think that I could get clean energy because I'm a renter and I'm low income and I didn't think it was for me. Clean energy, I thought was for the high, the rich people. And when she discovered that community solar existed, she got really excited. And she's, she said, you know, I... I don't have extra disposable income and this gives me a little bit of savings every month and every dollar matters. And I also get to support my values and I don't have to choose between supporting my values like environmentalism and supporting my family because I have scarce income. And that's the beauty of community solar. This is another solar farm we worked on and I'll end this slide here and take any questions. Um, but this is a solar farm we worked on outside of the Boston area. This building next to it is the town recycling center. So every week people bring their recycling here. And this field used to be a landfill. It used to be a big town dump. And they capped that landfill and they put community solar on it. And now when people drop off the recycling on a weekly basis, they can see their solar farm. And they can see the solar farm that their neighbors have a portion of. And the idea is this is the America that we're trying to build, an America where you can get solar power regardless of the type of home you live in or your rooftop or whether you have the right credit score or whether you have the right income or any other marker of privilege. We need to get clean energy to more people because we need to drastically decrease our carbon emissions, get off fossil fuels and mitigate climate change. But there's also a moral aspect to this is the people, low income customers, the people that need solar savings the most are currently the least likely to get it. And yet they are the most afflicted by climate change. Low income populations, which are disproportionately black and brown, are disproportionately paying a portion of their salary on energy. And that's called having a higher energy burden, which many of you know. They are disproportionately living in hotter neighborhoods because they lack green space. They are disproportionately suffering from air pollution and asthma um, because of pollutants. They are disproportionately living next to fossil fuel plants and suffering from those effects. They are disproportionately affected by natural disasters because of where their housing is located. And even despite all of this suffering, they're disproportionately locked out of the clean energy market. That is not just, that is not equitable. And so 
it's not a question of whether we're going to transition to clean energy. We will. Um, and this current political environment is giving us another boost of momentum towards that vision. But there is a question of whether this transition will be equitable. And so what we do today changes whether it's equitable tomorrow, which is why this kind of work is so important. And I'll stop here and answer any questions that anyone has. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for the summary. Um, that was that was amazing, and there's a lot to unpack there for sure. Um, I'm going to selfishly take the first question uh, sure. that that stood out for me, and even doing the research ahead of this webinar was talking about how people find out about community, community solar. And your direct quote when you were doing the case study um, on that homeowner was, once she discovered that community solar existed, it became an opportunity for her. How are you guys getting that, that message out to the communities that really need it? And, and is that, has that been a hurdle? Is it, have you seen an improvement in that? Like, what's, what's going on? Yeah, great question. So some of our biggest learnings have been around what gets people to change their behavior on this stuff. What gets people to buy clean energy? The problem that afflicts everyone in the clean energy industry right now is uh, uh, on the residential side is that no one wakes up in the morning and thinks, you know what will solve all my problems? Community solar. Community solar is going to solve all my problems. No one actively is thinking, I have consumer choice in how uh, I get my energy and I'm gonna practice that consumer choice because most people don't understand how we get our energy. Most people don't have that much of a choice um, um, and if you live in a regulated utility area, if you do live in a deregulated utility area, most people don't even know that they can pick other suppliers. So there's a lack of understanding and thus there's a lack of trust in energy. People don't trust energy companies. They largely are, don't love their commu uh, customer experience with their utilities. Energy companies have been sued in class action lawsuits for cheating people, particularly in the retail electricity space. Um, people have been screwed over by energy companies. So there's just a lack of understanding, a lack of trust, and that's the environment in which we're trying to get people to c c switch to clean energy. So what works? Um, what works is actually not to talk about so much the environmental and the financial benefits. And this is a study that actually came out of Yale. Um, Ken Gillingham is the professor and his studies looked at rooftop solar. And they found that the number one reason why anyone signed up for rooftop solar was not the financial reason, was not the environmental reason. It was actually because their friends and neighbors went solar that they saw their friends and neighbors go solar and they wanted to do it too. Another study, um, there's a center for um, uh, behavioral economics research on climate. They saw, they looked at what causes people to take climate friendly actions. And climate friendly actions can mean switching to renewable energy or recycling or composting. And they said, if someone is a Democrat or a Republican, does that change whether they take climate friendly actions? Fascinatingly, it does not change whether you take climate friendly actions. That doesn't have any predictive bearing um, whether you're a Democrat or Republican. They looked at what if you believe in climate change? Does that change whether you take climate friendly actions? And they found actually it doesn't matter if you believe in climate change or not. That's not predictive of whether you take climate friendly actions. The only thing that they found most predictive of whether someone takes climate friendly actions is whether they think other people around them are doing it too. So the insights from these two studies, and, and our, our work shows this too, is that people will do clean energy, they will take climate friendly actions if they think everyone around them is doing it too. It actually is not about moral decisions, it, it, this is about human psychology. And so we learned that if we were going cold, cold calling people, if we were showing up at their door and saying, hey, why don't you buy solar because it's good for the world and it's gonna save you money, conversion rates are actually pretty low. It'll work, but at conversion rates of one to 2%. And if you go to someone and you're their friend and you say, hey, I just switched to community solar and maybe you should consider it switching it too, our conversion rate is 50 to 70%. So that's incredible. That tells you why people need a, a messenger that they trust to carry this message. It says a lot about how we're going to get ourselves out of this political logjam of polarization is that we need people we trust to give us 
uh, the information about things that can help us. But without that basic level of trust, people don't switch. So we realize, okay, money is not the currency we operate in. We, the currency we operate in is trust. And we can only move at the speed of trust. And trust is earned, not entitled. And so our whole business operation is hinging on us building community trust and building it faster. So that was a long preamble to answer your question. Apologies. I'll answer it shortly, which is that how do we find customers? We go through community partnerships with local community organizations, and that can mean a house of worship, something smaller like that, or it can mean a big school district or a municipality. And we share our revenues with that community partner, and they spread the word about community solar to their community. At a very core, um, like human level, we all want belonging. We all want to feel a, feel a part of something, especially now when everyone's so isolated. And so when you do something about climate change or clean energy, you don't have to only think about the effects of climate change and clean energy, because sometimes that's not going to be the most effective methodology. You have to think about meeting people where they're at and just building a very basic level of trust. I'll stop there. No, I mean, that was, that was an amazing answer too, because other questions had come in on like, how do I get involved? Like I'm an advocate for clean energy. What do I do in my local community? And that's one of the things that I think is, is fantastic about what you guys do and what community solar brings. It, it really is that grassroots element of, of togetherness and, and doing something for your local community at home, which, which is something that I think when we try to attack clean energy from other avenues, we're not, we're not, we're missing that piece of it. So I think that that's, that's a fantastic point. And I, I think it's a, it's a really important point to go after. Um, can, you, can you talk briefly, there's, there's a few questions that have come up about the like logistics. Um, obviously, you know, if we're putting solar on individual homes here and there, that's a lot messier. There's a lot more that goes into that. You've got somebody going to each house, installing, installing, installing. Um, but, but that's something that I think it's each individual homeowner. When you do community solar projects, it's one massive project, but then how do you partner with the utility? How do you hook up to the grid? How much infrastructure logistics go into that? And, and are, there, are there any other competitors in that market that, that fight you on, on some of those um, connections to the, to the old grid and the old way of doing things? Yeah, so a lot of the people when they first hear about community solar say wait wh what about the utility what happens with the utility like who are the players and essentially there are two types of regulatory regimes that community solar exists in of course because regulations and energies are complicated so one type um, and the the environment we operate in is when a state has passed a law saying people can benefit from solar even if it's not on their own rooftop they can benefit from this virtual solar farm and it's generally called community solar laws or um, community renewables laws. And these, the, that, that's, in these states, private developers, like any other commercial real estate developer, is built, are, they're building these projects. And they're do, building them just like they would any other utility scale or commercial scale solar farm, um, except a different size. And typical, typically community solar farms are about two, three megawatts, which will serve around 300, 400 customers. And um, they can go up to the kind of max out at five megawatts. Um, and they could get much smaller than two megawatts, but those tend to be more expensive projects, more co-op driven, more very local community projects. But at a commercial level, we're looking at three megawatt farms. And, you know, the development cycle on those farms is about a year or two, um, more likely the two year mark. And the developer is securing the land, securing the permitting uh, for the solar farm, securing the financing, the capital stack for the solar farm. At the same time, um, they're doing that. We are partnering with them and we're starting to enroll customers for these projects, even before they're built. Because the way that solar financing works, you cannot get your final tranche of financing to construct the project without generating demand for the project. So you have to find the people before you can build the project. And that's where we come in. And that's in year zero, zero of a project. Then the project gets constructed. It gets turned, it gets the interconnection approval from the utility and it gets turned on. And in these states where the state has said people can benefit from community solar, utilities are legally obligated to allow people to benefit from it. They don't get to say, no, we, we're, we're going to reject someone's um, 
community solar farm because it's legislated. So utilities don't love it because the more people that switch to solar, generally the less revenues they see because they're not the supplier of electricity. This is one forcing mechanism that has gotten utilities to say, maybe we should do more renewables too because we're losing money from people leaving us to do renewables. And, um, and then, and then the project gets turned on and then the electricity will flow back from the solar farm to the grid. And then participants get a credit for a portion of that power. And we size your share to be approximately equal to the amount of electricity you use. So we look and see how much electricity you use. When you sign up, we're, we integrate with your utility account. We can see how much electricity you use. We give you say 10 panels in the solar farm, whatever those 10 panels produce every month, you'll get a credit for that. And then we'll sell you those credits at a 10% discount. That's how you get your guaranteed discount is you'll always pay less than you would have paid the utility for the same amount of power in these states. Um, there's another regulatory regime that exists where utilities are starting to do community solar themselves, um, largely regulated utilities in states that don't have community solar laws. Those programs are often um, see low uptake because they're often offered at a premium um, price but those are also just in pilot phase. They're just getting started. Utilities are just starting to throw their hat in the ring, which is kind of amazing because two years ago, they were trying to squash any community solar from developing. So the world is changing, utilities are changing, but all of this is happening super rapidly. I'll stop there in terms of logistics. You're right, it's, it's an amazing time for this and hopefully it'll continue to grow and we'll continue to get more people access to solar. And along those same lines that you were talking about, you know, when it comes to it comes to pricing with especially low income um, communities, is there is there a, a different scale that you have for pricing based on needs or based on score or based on and is there like a is there an algorithm you guys use? Is there some sort of formula that you use for that? For the energy score algorithm, we so we develop the algorithm um, uh, using the bunch of data that we found, the only data that we could find in the entire country that had correlated um, FICO scores with people's utility repayment history. Generally, that data was really not available. Um, the, you know, looking at people's utility repayment history and then seeing what their FICO score was. We found by analyzing that data using both probit regressions as well as machine learning regressions that there isn't actually a, a correlation between FICO score and utility repayment history. At high FICO scores, if you're, you have a high FICO score, you're probably going to pay your utility bill. But if you have a low FICO score, you may still be paying your utility bill because you don't want your power to be cut off. And so because there's not that correlation, we built our own algorithm based on the significant variables in our machine learning regressions that we found to be a predictor of utility payments. And then when we built that regression, I mean, the algorithm, we found that our algorithm was more inclusive of low to moderate income Americans. So you, you can have more accuracy and have it be more inclusive. It is a machine learning algorithm, which means it gets smarter over time. And so what, what, what phase we're in now is in the testing phase, using it on pilot projects. Um, thankfully, that we have a number of developers, including the largest wind and solar developer in the world that has accepted using our energy score rather than using FICO. So we're training the data, we're making the data smarter. And then in the next two years, we'd like to commercialize the energy score. So not only we use it, but other developers use it too, because we've been approached by a lot of them. And not to go off topic a little bit, but have you guys thought about bringing that, that same uh, approach to, to other financing? Where, where a lot of other issues like mortgages and car loans and things like that too. I mean, I'm sure, I'm sure it's the same problem. Yeah, and there are other solutions outside of energy that in, especially in banking, they're starting to look more and more alternative credit scores, even Experian and TransUnion and these credit agencies are starting to say, maybe we should look at alternative data because um, our, our, our old way of doing credit scores is pretty, pretty archaic. But um, in energy, there have been other types of energy products that have come to us saying, hey, we want to use the energy score too, which has been a little bit of a surprise because we invented it for community solar, but we've been approached by many more rooftop solar developers to use it um, because rooftop solar has such a hard time finding customers and the customer acquisition costs are so high there. So they want to expand the pool. And so that is, I think, the next foray for us, whether we go outside of energy is, is to be determined. 
All right. So one one of the other major topics on on if I can if I can take a lot of the questions coming in is around the state policies, state programs, uh, legislation. I mean, unfortunately, a lot of this legislation and policy is what drives clean energy adoption in different states, and it has way too much to do with clean energy, for that matter. But if we if we want to get this growing throughout the entire country. I mean, it's got to start with some policy changes because number one, not every state offers this. Is that is that correct? Yeah, there are about 20 states that have passed it in their state legislatures and another 20 states that um, have utility-led community solar. So 42 states in total across the country have some sort of community solar, but there are probably like 10 states that are really accelerated in it. And, and so what do you see as the future for, for policy and legislation around clean energy and, and around, you know, specifically community solar? And what, what do you think the next big steps and the next big dominoes that we need to fall to, to allow these states to kind of open things up and make it a little bit easier? Yeah, and I want to be clear about one thing, which is that people think because I am a CEO of a community solar company that I think community solar is a silver bullet. I And there is no silver bullet in climate, right? That's, that's part of why we're in this pickle is because there are no easy answers. And so I do not pretend that community solar will solve all our problems or it's the only way to get access, um, clean energy access to a lot of people. Um, and a lot of people say, well, why do we even focus on distributed generation? Like why rooftop solar and community solar, which have high customer acquisition costs? Why not just go straight to forcing all utilities to do 100% clean? And that would be great if that were actually within reach in the amount of time that we need to, uh, we have left to, to mitigate our carbon emissions. Like if in the next nine years, if we could get every utility in the country to have 100% clean energy, then great. But unfortunately, things are more complicated than that. Um, utilities don't move the fastest. And so expecting them all to adopt this standard is um, really unfair, particularly when our technology is not there. Like wind and solar cannot provide 100% reliable clean energy today. It could probably provide um, uh, reliable energy for 80% of our day, 85% of our day, but we're gonna need additional innovation in storage, in demand response. Um, to get to that 100%, and those solutions are being invented at the moment. And so if we just like, all acknowledge that it's not going to be a utility-only solution, it's not going to be a private sector-only solution, that this is an all-hands-on-deck problem and we need all-hands-on-deck solutions, then community solar is a really important part of that solution set. And in terms of policy, we're seeing changes on a national level that are pretty great. Now that we there's democratic control of the Senate, we may possibly get a clean energy national standard, which is unheard of, you know, a year ago. So that's cool. But right now, one in three Americans lives in a state that has a 100% renewable or clean standard. Already in the last two years, we've gotten to a place where one out of three Americans live in a state with 100% renewable or clean standard. But if you go to those state legislatures or those, those policymakers in those states and you say, how are you going to get to 100% renewable or clean? Nobody has any idea yet. You know, they're like, we just passed the standard. We're trying to figure that out now. So this is a really exciting time where the policies need to be legislated. We need to advocate for policies that solve the what are we going to do now that we have our hands tied and we have to get to 100% renewable or clean well community solar has to be a part of that we have to incentivize evs we have to incentivize um, more like energy efficiency we have to incentivize uh, more um, demand response and distributed generation we need to incentivize it all because we have to electrify everything so the, um, the policies that there are a lot of people advocating for those policies of electrifying everything. There are not that many people advocating for policies to make this more inclusive and equitable to the frontline climate communities that are most affected by climate change. That's our job. That's Solstice's job is to, with a bunch of people in the Environmental Justice Committee community, we will advocate that not only should we electrify everything, but we have to invest, we have to spend money to invest in the people who are most affected by climate change and are most locked out of this problem. So those are the solutions that unfortunately, because of the environment, the energy system we all inherited, that is this patchwork system that was based on the screwed up way that the grid was developed over a hundred years ago, we have to do things in a patchwork style um, on a state by state level in policy. But we have this incredible opportunity on the federal level now to have a more cohesive, coordinated, 
all of government approach to climate. And that's why I'm so optimistic right now. No, I mean, optimism is, um, that's the new word for 2021, right? We all need to have optimism after last year. Hey, so I'm, I'm curious, we have one of our attendees actually uh, has a question, he's got his hand up. Uh, Kevin, can you, uh, I just made you uh, able yeah. to talk. Welcome, Kevin. Welcome. So, actually, let me see if I can turn this on. Um, I'm an energy policy wonk. I've worked on the legislative side of community solar for years. Uh, Connecticut actually does permit community solar, but only to a very limited extent. And that's because the electric utilities have been arguing that community solar involves subsidies between participants and non-participants, which in utility regulatory land is a no-no. Um, I'm not saying that that's a correct argument, but I'm saying it's been a politically persuasive argument. Mm -hmm. um, have you been dealing with that in other states? Yeah, absolutely. I think most utilities I've talked to about their community solar pilots, um, they have this pickle where they can't offer the savings that private developers can because they can't treat different rate payers, uh, they can't give different rate payers advantages that other rate payers can't get. So the fact that a problem, a, a program like community solar is only available to a few people makes it harder for the utility to offer it. But where I, I see utilities offering it successfully and giving people um, uh, savings is they're saying, we're not going to stop at this one community solar project. Like our plan is to develop many, many megawatts of it um, and and either make it kind of serve there are a couple of municipal owned utilities that say this they want we they, we eventually want to serve all of our customers with something like community solar um, and and so that the municipal owned utility can say that because they can place their generation facilities closer to where the load is and that's advantageous for them whereas a IOU has a harder time um, justifying that or just more people to serve. And in the IOU case, the investor-owned utility case, we've seen um, where community solar can be applied only to underserved communities or low-income communities that can you can, you can offer um, a program to a select few people. And so that you kind of are starting to see that with Florida Power and Light's giant two gigawatts um, solar community solar facility they're offering a big chunk of that to lmi low to moderate income is that get at what you're asking kevin or did you have a different take on your question somewhat different take um although targeting lmi customers is something that we're doing here in connecticut um the the argument that the utilities have been raising is not really a scale issue but that um what Community Solar does is to subsidize those folks who subscribe. And again, I don't actually buy this argument, but the legislators I worked for for 25, 30 years did and still do by and large. Um, and that that's a real impediment. Um, so in Connecticut, um, we passed legislation authorizing a pilot uh, close to 10 years ago and really really haven't seen anything happen yet. Um, so I'm saying that the politics are pretty wicked. Yeah, the, I mean, yes, the, I agree that the politics are uh, w wicked. I, I don't really buy the subsidy argument that's leveled against community solar or renewables for that matter. Um, and you know this because you're a policy wonk, but the, you know, the fact of the matter is we already have a lot of billions of dollars in subsidies to fossil fuel um, uh, sources of power. And, and so when the subsidy argument, like we can't spend money on renewables or we can't spend money allowing this new form of renewables to get to a, a cost curve um, that's, that's more, that it, it, get to it at, to a point where you don't need subsidies anymore. Like that, that argument I don't buy because that is how renewable energy got started. That's how we got to a point where we have scalable technology now that where the cost curve doesn't require subsidies is because we subsidizes, subsidized um, technology and innovation in, initially so that we could, we could start the flywheel of um, making this more accessible and more affordable to people. So 
for those two arguments, I don't, I don't buy the, the subsidy argument, but I know you're right when you say that it's very, um, it, the subsidy argument is toxic politically and it, it hinders it progress on clean energy. Mm. So I tend to go and, and attack the, the argument rather than argue the merits of whether this is a subsidy or not. Mm. Thank you. Thanks, Kevin. Yeah, thanks, Kevin. Um, I actually got another uh, attendee that would like to talk. Uh, Lynn, you have a question for Stephanie? Hi, yes, I'm Lynn. I, I actually put it in the chat, but I, I guess I needed to raise my hand. So I'm also uh, knowledgeable about Kevin McCarthy, and uh, we actually are on the same committees. So my concern, um, and I'm hoping that you can help with some more information is that um, homeowners that put an array on their home are allowed to net meter. And, you know, oftentimes if they get a low interest loan through the Connecticut Green Bank, for example, their, their array is paid off in seven years. And they, you know, if the lifetime of the array is 20 years, they're looking at 13 years of net metered electricity where they're only paying the administrative fee every month to the utility. Um, so the community sh uh, shared uh, the community solar that's being offered as a pilot now is similar to what you're talking about, but um, I I don't understand how low to moderate income residents will ever achieve the benefits that a homeowner that net meters would achieve in this process. And part of it is I don't understand how much the developer earns. How do people know that the financial um, benefit from this community solar is, is fair? You know, we, we don't, you know, as, as a participant or a subscriber, we don't have any access to information about, to, to judge whether you know, the developers making a, a lot of money and it's not being fairly shared with the, with the participants. And that's, to me, it's, it's all kind of like hidden. So. Yeah, it completely, there's not a lack of transparency and, and thus goes back to that lack of trust. And to, to, you know, we, if someone can do rooftop solar, if you're one of the unicorns that has the right rooftop and you have the right ability to pay for it, we say, please go do rooftop solar. You're going to save more money over time. You're going to have, you're going to own, um, likely you're going to probably own the asset. You're just going to, it's going to be more valuable to you if you can do rooftop solar. We, this is just a solution for people that cannot do rooftop solar, that cannot or don't want to buy a, a renewable retail supplier at a premium. This is an opportunity for people who don't fit those categories to participate in clean energy. So overall, because they're not going to pay an upfront cost, um, there's no outlay of money initially that is taken on by the developer and the financier, like you said. So the value to the subscriber is going to be much lower than to the developer financier who's putting up the upfront $5 million to build the solar farm. But they can, the participant still is going to benefit and they're going to benefit more than had they done nothing, which is their current option. Um, they're getting at, at least about a 10% savings on their electricity bill. Uh, and so the developer is getting paid by taking undertaking that risk of building the project, spent um, investing in the upfront installation cost, and then they're getting paid back over time. You know, they and they're looking for the same kind of return expectations they would on any other um, commercial or CNI uh, solar facility. To your point about does the LMI per, um, resident actually really benefit? So. In this, there's a debate in the in the world of low income inclusion about whether something like a low income resident getting a subscription to community solar and saving 10% off their electricity bill a year is that's where we start. That's not where we end. the 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 end ideal point is that low income customers and communities of color can participate in the financial benefits of a solar farm, but they that nut has not been cracked yet because you have to figure out how does that community either pay for some of the installation costs and thus claim some of the ownership benefits or 
um, how does ownership get transferred for the people who paid for the farm to the beneficiaries of the farm? So it's, there's a lot of unanswered questions in the um, topic of low-income inclusion. But the important thing here is that we're starting in a place where low-income customers can get 10% savings on their bills, and they didn't have that option before outside of energy assistance programs offered by the government, which are pure subsidies. Um, the other thing to th remember is LMI means it's a big group. There are about 40% of the country that earns as a family of four less than 50,000 a year. So that's a family of four earning less than 50,000 a year. About 40% of the country falls under that. When you And so that's a big chunk of the, the country. LMI can apply to all of those, but within that, there's segmentation. Let's not treat all low-income customers the same. Some low-income customers can never pay their bill, and they should benefit from LIHEAP and other energy assistance programs. But there are some LMI customers that pay their utility bills on time, and they need savings. And those are the ones that we're looking to increase access to because they number in the millions, um, and they don't get clean energy. Does that answer some of your questions, Lynn? Yeah, yeah thank you. It, it's uh do you do you publish the uh... Ooh, that was unfortunate if you put your um comment in the chat i can answer the rest of it yeah i don't know what sorry about that lynn i don't know what happened to get you cut off there but um we will make sure steph I, there's been a lot of requests <laughs> for contact information too so there's a lot of people that want to follow up with you i don't want to put that out there but i, I do want to ask you you know there are some people that want to follow up with yeah, please do reach out on LinkedIn. I um, and uh, find me on LinkedIn, and we can continue the conversation from there. In particular, um, I'm not sure I answered your question, Kevin McCarthy. So if you want to chat more, let me know. But there's there's so much more collaboration that we need to do together. Uh, do you release the financial info regarding developer income? Um, that's that's not our information to release. I think we would be in um, contravention with our with our partnership agreements with the developer to release their own financial model. We actually don't get out their own financial model. We understand the regulation, what, what the developer earns is what the regulatory environment says that their electricity is worth when they sell it back to the grid. So you can calculate what a developer earns based on the regulations of each state, but we don't, we don't get their individual financial uh, models for their projects. In general, the developer just at a high level is being paid by um, the subscription fees that the subscribers are sending to them every month. They're getting some of their revenue that way. Um, they're monetizing the recs because they own the project, because they put up the upfront costs of the project. They are the ones that own the renewable energy certificates for that project and where applicable, they're monetizing those credits. Um, and then lastly, the tax equity benefits, whether they're the investor themselves or they find other third party tax equity investors, that's the other revenue stream for these projects. The reason why community solar has grown so quickly is because it's very lucrative for developers. They're rather than sell power at the wholesale rate to the utility, they're now getting to sell power at a higher price um, directly to residents. And so it makes it much more lucrative for them. That's why all these developers that used to do utility and CNI are now moving into the residential and community solar space. I mean, that was a fantastic answer, Lynn. Hopefully that was, oh, she gave you a big thank you. So that was good. I apologize for okay. that, Lynn. I don't know what happened. Um, Steph, last, last eight minutes or so, I got a couple quick ones for you. Let's sure. talk Oh, there are three S's. They're my three S's that I have for you. Space, storage, and software. So space, when we're talking about low income, um, a lot of times urban areas, is it hard finding space? And then when you do find space, is it, is it sometimes a battle with other people that also want to utilize that space for something else? And, and then have you also seen companies in some of these areas or buildings um, sort of use their rooftop instead of a field? instead of something that's more traditional for community solar? Yeah, the vast majority of community solar projects, especially when you're talking at the three megawatt level, they're generally ground mounted. And so that's a couple of football fields, you know, maybe five acres. And so you need a, a decent amount of space. And that's why the siting of these projects have generally been more in rural and suburban areas. But the people that can benefit from that power, who can buy the uh, portions of the community solar farm, 
those folks can be in urban areas. You just have to be in the same utility zone as your solar farm. That's what regulations say. And the reason why you have to be in the same utility zone is that's how you see your benefit. You see the credits that show up on your utility bill. And so utility zones are really um, nonsensical in how the borders uh, are drawn on a map if you look up utility zones for your state. But they're, they're big zones in Massachusetts where we're based. There are three total utility zones. And so you can be three hours away from Boston and build a farm out in Cape Cod and it can serve the Boston area. And that's the beauty of community solar. You can use land that's good for solar and allow other people who don't have that land or don't have that rooftop plug into it. The, there are instances of rooftop solar, um, community solar installations. And actually one of the projects we're working on is with the New York City Housing Authority. So across 70 public housing buildings across New York City, we're, we're kind of um, culminating in a two megawatt community solar facility that will go partially to NYCHA low-income residents. And so that project is way more expensive than a ground-mounted um, farm, but there are a lot of low-income incentives in New York that make it still work out, um, pencil out as a project. But it comes down to you know, what are the compensation rates in that geographic area? And can you offset the increased cost of doing a rooftop versus a ground mounted facility? The other thing I'd say is a really fascinating benefit um, that we're seeing with community solar farms is that some farmers that have land that they can't use for agricultural purposes, maybe that land is, you know, fallow or um, some other reason, they're monetizing their land and using that for community solar. And that's allowing, we've seen actual farmers that have been able to keep the doors open on their farms because they've monetized this extra revenue stream. We say ourselves, if, there, if the land can be used for other productive purposes, it shouldn't be used, it shouldn't be locked out for, for 30 years in a solar farm if you can use it for more valuable purposes. But on a capped landfill, on farmland that's not being used, you can actually create wealth and create um, pr uh, prosperity opportunities for people to lease or buy that land. So those are some of the ways that we think of land use when it comes to community solar. No, I, I appreciate that. And, and on to storage, right? This is the last year in our in our blueprint for clean energy webinar series. We we had two different uh, storage companies coming and talking about how critical it is. And then our one of the webinars we did earlier, uh, we talked about the duck curve in California and some of the demand curve and, and things like that. So, in your eyes, how important is storage? And you know, right now for the average homeowner, especially low income, it's not it's not in the budget. So, how do you see that? you know, working out in the future as, as sort of teaming up with community solar. Yeah, I, community solar needs to be sold back to the grid. That is just how the regulatory regime works. And that is obviously a big weakness of community solar because that makes it open to um, regulatory changes and and I've always seen the advent of storage options becoming cheaper and cheaper and attaching storage to these community solar farms as the, one of the most exciting developments that will happen in the next five to 10 years. And that makes, that kind of turns community solar into more microgrid solutions, but it makes these projects more resilient. It means that power can be sold back to the grid at the time that it's most advantageous to sell power, not necessarily when it's being produced. And when you have value of solar um, regulatory regimes the way you do in New York State, where the time that you sell power back to the grid vastly changes the, your compensation rates for it. Um, and that allows us to incentivize people selling power back to the grid when we need the grid, when we need to meet our, our grid demand. And so, you know, um, one of the best books I've read in the past few years is The Grid, and it opened my eyes to seeing what uh, fundamentally we need to do to advance clean energy that's more in, um, on the grid modernization side and that's a huge part of how we move forward and getting storage and investing in storage so that it's cheaper because it's not there yet um, is a huge part of how we advance forward but it, it's a part of the solution set and and we need it to get to 100 percent renewables because the technology isn't there for wind and solar with intermittent um, being an intermittent source to provide the power that we need to get at 100%. Well, I, I agree with you. And that was, that was our big, that was a big focus for us last year too, was trying to have that conversation about storage and how important it is because 
with even the rooftop installation people and all the advent of that and I don't think enough information was out there about what some of the the downfall is to too much solar and, and all this energy being curved and, and sent away or put into the ground uh, so I do I'm a big believer in storage and, and hopefully we can figure out more ways to get into more and more homes last question I have for you uh, around your software you know really diving into that I know you showed a nice slide in the presentation managing the entire process is is a, a high wire act in its own right and it looks like you've developed actually some custom software to allow you guys to be a differentiator and to handle this a little bit easier for companies are you are you seeing this as another way to to grow this space quicker to make it easier to do business have you seen your software as a big differentiator um if you could talk a little bit about that to kind of wrap this up here that'd be great yeah, absolutely. So we didn't start out as a software company. I am the CEO now of a software company, um, but I am not a tech person myself. Thankfully, we have an incredible team of tech folks. But the the reason why we got to this place is because we were signing people up for community solar farms and we were using other software and it was horrible. I, energy is not an industry that's known for beautiful UX and UI or amazing user-friendly software, largely because people um, have been mostly using utility software to interact with their energy and, and often you, software upgrades aren't even included in their rate case. So um, that's all to say that we were using software that looked like a spreadsheet viewer, like almost like it was from the, the Clinton administration. And we entered the, and it was get it was taking some people, especially old folks, an hour to use the software to sign up for clean energy. And a big lesson I told you about, you know, why people sign up for clean energy earlier. It's why their friends and neighbors doing it. Another reason why people sign up is because it's easy and simple. If it's complicated, people just back away slowly and they don't want to touch clean energy with a stick. And so, we said, let's get in, we need to get into the software business. There needs to be a way for people to sign up for community solar in five minutes, not an hour. Um, and we need to build, we just need to make it easier for people to even tell their friends and neighbors about it. We need to make it easier for people to be qualified and not use FICO scores and run a separate FICO check, but we can integrate our energy score into a software. And so we saw technology as the enabler for everything that we were talking about, about getting it, getting clean energy to people more easily in a more user-friendly manner and in a way that meets people where they're at, treating them as customers rather than treating them as rate payers. And so what that so software is is the, the tool that unlocks access. Um, in tech, in our in tech startups, too often tech companies either lack a moral compass or their moral compass is one of convenience. How do we create an app that or allows us to order, you know, f pizza faster? Um, and that's important because there's a demand for that. But how do we use our technology innovations um, to, to, to guide us morally? How do we be moral leaders using technology? Well, we create new innovations that change how just or equitable systems are. And so software for us became the tool to achieve a more um, equitable and just energy system rather than just a tool of convenience. Beautiful, that was a perfect way to summarize everything too, Steph. So I wanna appreciate everybody for, for being with us today. Uh, Steph, big thank you. Um, I know you're very, very busy. Uh, especially kicking off a new year with a whole new administration, whole new policy. It's going to be a very exciting year, I think, for everybody in energy and equity and community solar. So again, I want to give you a big thank you, um, giving you a big round of applause silently, I'm sure, for all the participants here. Um, for everybody that's been listening, you can check this out again. We're going to record this and post it onto the CBA website, the Center for Business at, in the Environment at Yale. Um, and this has been the Blueprint for Clean Energy webinar series. And until next time, take care, everybody. Thanks again, Steph. Thank you. Have a good day, everyone.